Welcome. I'm happy to study with you and have another opportunity to discuss the history of the Lord's Church. This is the second lesson uh, in this particular part of our Bible overview and uh, plan of redemption series. And in looking at the history of the Lord's Church, we looked last time at a principle as to why there are so many different uh, denominations in Christendom today, why there are so many different forms of the gospel being preached. How did this come about? Well, we looked at a principle from the beginning of the Bible all the way through to the end of the Bible that men often depart from God's way. And this has happened time and time again in the patriarchal age, in the Mosaic age, throughout the Old Testament. It was warned about by Jesus. Uh, it is something that the New Testament prophesied would happen, that people would depart from the pure gospel. And in this lesson, we want to look at the history of a great falling away from the original New Testament church, the original pattern of worship and work that the New Testament teaches and that the church followed in the first century. And in looking at these things, we want to encourage all to come back to that original pattern, come back to that original plan for the church. That is the safe and the right way that we can have confidence in. Uh, in looking at the falling away, Jesus talked about the fact that the kingdom is established and spread, that it has its succession from one generation to another through the word of God. That's the way that uh, the church is perpetuated is through the, the seed, which is the word of God. In the parable of the sower, Jesus said about the seed that was sown by the Son of Man that it is the seed of the kingdom. The word of God is the seed of the kingdom. Luke chapter 8 and verse 11. If you want to grow Christians today that are just like those in the first century, you need to plant that pure seed. If you want to have a church that belongs to Jesus Christ, you need to build it according to that word, and follow the pattern that is found there. God's word is compared to the seed sown in a field. Pure seed produces after its own kind, and it only produces one kind of plant when it's sown. Uh, united and undenominational Christians is what the pure word of God would grow, because that's what you had from that word in the first century. It can't produce different denominations. If you sow that pure seed, we should have confidence that we will get the same harvest today that the apostles and prophets and early evangelists got in the first century time. Jesus told a parable that while the servants of God were sleeping, that an enemy came and sowed bad seed in the field, in the parable of the wheat and the tares. The enemy, the devil, introduces false doctrine into the world, a corrupt seed of religion that is not the pure word of God, but some admixture of human doctrine and divine doctrine mixed together, and it produces um, a crop that... Uh, looks like the original, but when it bears fruit, you find out that it's not the same. And there's a lot of false seed that has been sown into the world, and it continues to be sown. When you mix together human creeds and doctrines and philosophies to the gospel, you're going to end up with a different gospel. You're going to end up with different kinds of churches, and we need to be on guard and not asleep to this particular fact. Preachers and priests and rabbis can teach false doctrine. It's been that way uh, in every age. And Jesus often warned about those that are teaching something other than the pure word of God. 
In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 15, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. They look good, they sound right, but when you examine their doctrine and you compare it to the pure word of God, you find that it differs. Every seed produces after its own kind. That is the law in every kingdom that God has made. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 11, he created the animal or the vegetable kingdom, the plant kingdom, uh, full grown in the beginning. But each of those plants had seed in them, and they were able to re re reproduce after their own kind. They were bearing fruit after their kind with seed in them, and it was so. So God's law of reproduction, he starts by miracle with full grown plants. And then after that, you get more plants according to the divine law that God has established of reproduction. You plant the seed of that plant and it will reproduce after its kind. It works the same way in the fleshly kingdom. Uh, human beings, we plant uh, our seed and they combine and as a result, you have another human being that's born after its kind. So in the animal kingdom, it works in the same way. Uh, each seed produces after its own kind. The spiritual kingdom, the same way. You had in the beginning, the church and the gospel begun by miracle. The Holy Spirit was given to the apostles and to those on whom they laid their hands to impart spiritual gifts. Those apostles and prophets were guided by the Holy Spirit to preach all of the truth and to write the truth down in their letters that they sent to the churches. Then those letters were all gathered together and they were confirmed to be the word of God. And we have our New Testament. And now, if you want to have Christians, if you want to have churches today that are the same as the ones in the New Testament, then you need to plant that pure word of God in the hearts of men. You need to follow the pattern that is found in that New Testament gospel. It's according to God's revealed law of reproduction that you're going to get um, Christ's church in the world today. Seed is sown, and it produces after its kind. It's never a different plant that comes forth. It's never a different animal that comes forth in the animal kingdom. And in the church, the principle works the same way. The plant, you plant the seed, it grows up. And if you plant corn, then you're going to get corn. If you plant wheat, you're going to get wheat. In the animal kingdom, if an eagle from its seed is going to produce an eagle and not a sparrow. And when it comes to the spiritual kingdom, if you plant the pure word of God without addition or subtraction in the hearts of men, it's going to bring forth through conversion a Christian, just like the Christians that we read about in the New Testament. If you establish a congregation and you follow the pattern of that word, you're going to have one of Christ's churches today that's the same as the church that we read about in the New Testament days. We can see the word of God when it is planted in the hearts of men, gives them evidence whereby they can believe, have faith, and that faith moves you to repentance. And that repentance leads to confession of your faith. And upon that confession of faith, you're baptized into Jesus Christ. And you are a New Testament Christian. The pure word can't produce different churches. It'll only produce the one church we read about in the Bible. Doctrines producing different denominations are a departure from what God's original plan was all about. It's unsafe to go down that road. The one gospel, the one church, the unity of faith and practice is what we read about in the New Testament. Paul warned of a coming departure from that original plan. In 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, but the Spirit says that in latter times, some will fall away from the faith. So there was one faith. But in later days, Paul said, the Spirit foretells there'll be those that will depart from the faith. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 4, and 
will turn, us, turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to miss. You must constantly preach the pure word of God, he told Timothy, because people are going to turn away their ears from the pure gospel. They're going to want to have doctrines in accordance with their own desires. In Matthew 7 and verse 15, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Jesus warned those original disciples that there would be false teachers that would arise. In Galatians 1 and verse 6, Paul said to the Galatians that were beginning to uh, join the pure gospel on with uh, different teachings coming over from the law of Mo Moses and from Judaizing uh, teachers. I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. When you add on other doctrines to the pure gospel, you have a different gospel, and it's going to produce different fruit. Some did depart as we look at the history of Christianity. There was a departure from that original New Testament church that we read about and that original faith. The first major change that is noticed by historians in a departure from that original pattern that Jesus Christ gave. Remember in Matthew 28, 18, Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. And he set up that original gospel, that original doctrine and practice. Each congregation in the New Testament was ruled uh, by qualified men that served as elders over that church. They had deacons that worked with them. And uh, that was the original plan. Jesus is the head of all Christians. And in the local church, the local congregation, you had this simple organization. Can anybody today uh, claim that they have greater wisdom than Jesus Christ or God in changing the organization which he gave to the church in the beginning? Yet we're told in the year about 150, the, the organization of the church began to change in many congregations. You had uh, in the New Testament church as represented by these circles with the little uh, images of men within. That is the local church and the, they always had a plurality of elders in each congregation. These elders were also called bishops or overseers and they shepherded the church. They were shepherds or pastors of the church and no one was exalted in that elder eldership above another. It was as a group that they exercised authority and oversight over that local church. After the death of the apostles and a few years had passed, men began to exalt one of those elders as the president of the meeting, uh, the one that uh, would conduct the meeting, and eventually he gained uh, supremacy over the other elders and began to exclusively use the term bishop to describe um, his function. So there was a distinction made between bishops and, and elders, which wasn't there in the first century. So from this small beginning, the organization of the church began to change. Uh, ultimately, there was a struggle for power among these uh, different elders and bishops the elders presided over, out over a period of time, several congregations. Maybe you'd have a city uh, bishop, and other smaller congregations were started in the surrounding area, and he began to oversee not only his local church, but also these other local churches. Then their authority grew to be exercised over a whole district or diocese as they face different challenges and doctrines and struggles, these bishops began to gather together and have meetings together. And over time, they began to agree upon and formulate uh, doctrines that they would promote and that they would bind upon these local churches under their control. The first formal meeting of all of the bishops in the Roman Empire took place 
in the year 325 at Nicaea. They attended there uh, to try to settle different doctrinal disputes and opinions that were being taught uh, about the nature of Christ and the Trinity. And it was called by the emperor, and they came together to uh, formulate some rules and doctrines that they were going to bind upon um, the churches where they were uh, working and overseeing. And church laws and doctrines and commandments of men then were added on to the faith as a requirement for people to be considered faithful. Uh, the first human creed in 325 AD was designed to govern all Christians. It's called the Nicene Creed. And this is a, a matter of history. It's the father of all of the human creeds in Christianity. It was written by uh, Western and Eastern bishops that came together um, in the city of Nicene, or, or Nicaea. They were called together by the Emperor Constantine. It wasn't called by divine authority, but by the authority of the emperor. They assumed authority to make and to bind religious laws. And so they formulated that creed that they were going to insist that everybody agree upon. The Nicene Creed's the first creed generally accepted throughout the Roman Empire. Christians who would not subscribe to the wording of that creed were branded as heretics. Some remained faithful, of course, to God's word, but the great majority were subject to that creed. Over several generations, men became accustomed to this idea of synods or councils of these uh, bishops, and they would uh, pass laws for the church. And of course, in the New Testament, we only have one lawgiver, that is Jesus Christ, and his word is revealed to us through the apostles and prophets in the New Testament. Ultimately, a worldwide council system was accepted as the organizational structure of the church. This departed from God's way, just as men have often done, as we studied last time. It paved the way for the development of papal power, and Constantine uh, did not claim to be a Christian when he, as an emperor, called all of those bishops together and arranged that council, but he considered himself a friend of Christianity, and he thought the, uh, the teaching of the church at that time, was a unifying force in the Roman Empire, and he wanted people to come together to compromise and come up with some compromise language that they could use so there'd be no division among them. He claimed uh, to be a friend of the church, and he was very influential as the emperor of Rome. He did things like ordering the Bible to be reproduced, at government expense. He ordered 500 manuscripts to be copied of the New Testament, of the Bible, and he paid for the rebuilding of different uh, church buildings around the Roman Empire that had been destroyed during days of persecution. Christians had suffered cruel persecution before the coming of Constantine. Uh, there had been 10 serious, uh, brutal persecutions of God's people during the 300 years uh, or 225 years after uh, the death of the Apostle John. And it had been official government policy to persecute the church. But when Constantine came to power, he noticed the way that these Christians calmly faced persecution. The people of Rome saw the great courage with which they faced death and their strong faith in the salvation that Jesus Christ offered. And as a result, they had great influence uh, over other people in the Roman Empire. Constantine decided that these Christians and their faith was a powerful force in the Roman Empire. Christianity is something he decided should be nurtured befriended, and benefited for the good of the Roman Empire and for unity. 
and he issued an edict of Milan in 313 that ended persecution. And, of course, that was certainly a great day. But Constantine sought uh, on his own to make Christianity more popular. Christianity had been tolerated in the beginning. They just wanted it tolerated as one of the many religions of Rome. But Constantine used his influence as emperor, subtle influences, to endorse and to prop up the prestige of different bishops and leaders in the church in order that they might have greater influence in the empire. Christians were appointed to high offices. They were given gifts by the emperor. Some were awarded uh, money by the empire that had uh, suffered losses in the past. The bishops were granted, in some cases, judicial power and judgeships, and they were sometimes freed from Roman taxes. So after Constantine came to power and began to promote um, these bishops and these local churches, uh, there was uh, great influence by the government on the teaching of that time, and this had great uh, impact. Uh, it began to influence how many people were flooding now into the faith, not coming in by a pure uh, conversion to Jesus Christ and a desire to serve him and sacrifice for him, but now you could gain uh, physical, political advantage by coming in to the church. So there was a great uh, lowering of the standards uh, of the people that were in the church when all of these people began to flood in. And all of this would have never taken pay, place if people had simply been satisfied with the pure word of God. But what you had was people falling away from that original pure doctrine. You have now an interplay between church and state in the church. Constantine exercised, again, tremendous influence over the bishops in the church. He was not baptized himself until shortly before his death, but he had great sway over the Christians of his day. And that served his policy. It served his purposes. You can see the influence that the Roman organization of government had upon the development of a hierarchy within the church. In the Roman Empire, you had the emperor at the top. Under that were different advisors. Under those advisors were governors. There was a pyramid of authority that exists. And as you look at um, the development of the organization of the Roman Catholic Church, what you have in the Roman Empire is a pope at the top, cardinals, bishops, then you have uh, the lower bishops and so on, all the way down. And there's a pyramid structure that's modeled after that of the Roman Empire. An organization and structure that you can't find mentioned in the New Testament whatsoever when it comes to the organization of the church. As these bishops gained more and more authority and power, uh, you, you went from city bishops to metropolitan bishops, then to patriarchs over large parts of the Roman Empire, and eventually you came to the point of a universal bishop or pope. Over time, uh, the pope became, the, the, the bishop of Rome became recognized as the universal overseer of the church, the head of the church here on earth. And the pope again, used that term exclusively to exalt himself over all of the other bishops. It's a very interesting story of the struggle that went on between the uh, patriarch that was in charge in Constantinople, the eastern capital of the Roman Empire, and the Bishop of Rome. Uh, earlier, the Bishop of Constantinople had tried to claim that he was a universal bishop, and uh, the Bishop of Rome condemned him said that that was blasphemous to take such a title. 
And upon that patriarch's death, he got the Roman emperor to rescind that title that had been given to him. But then after the death of that pope, Boniface III uh, became the bishop of Rome, and he took upon himself the title of universal bishop. And from that day forward, uh, the bishop of Rome was called the pope and was called uh, the universal bishop, the head of all of the church. And there was no apostle that ever claimed such a position of power. So this was something new. So you see, you start off with just a small change in the local government of a local church. Then that influence and power grows gradually, generation after generation, and people depart further and further from God. You know, it's a strange thing. People can accept a little change. A big change would excite uh, people, and they would see it. But when it happens gradually over time, look what a great departure there was from what the organization of the New Testament church was all about. Where was the church that Jesus built? Where was Christ's church during all of this time? Well, they were usually found in small groups, minority groups, meeting in secret. You know, it's those that are great and powerful and political and influential that write the history of the ancient world. You don't hear about the small uh, groups that are walking in the narrow way and following the simple New Testament government for the church and preaching the pure gospel. Their, their history is obscured. As you look at the uh, progression and this falling away that had taken place, it continued on after 606 when the first pope came to power. Uh, finally, in 1054, there was a great schism, as it's called in history, between the uh, patriarch and the Eastern, the Greek part of the Catholic Church, and the Western part uh, of the Catholic Church, which was headed by the Bishop of Rome. Each of them excommunicated each other. And as a result, uh, the church, uh, the Roman Catholic Church was, uh, was split. And so the whole idea of universal is not universal, is it? There's a Western uh, Roman Catholic, and then there's Eastern Orthodox that broke out of this, uh, this great falling away in organization and doctrine. And so you have these two different groups now that go forward from that time. In 1054, these groups differed uh, in regard to... Uh, Instrumental music was one of the issues that they had in the eastern part of the church. They didn't practice instrumental music and worship. They had differences in other areas of doctrine as well. So they differed from each other, but they also both differed from what we read about in the New Testament church. Uh, they differed from the original faith that was once for all delivered by the Holy Spirit to the saints. So this trend away, it continues to proceed even to this day. There's a constant evolution and change that takes place all the time within these human organizations that have come about. Both moved and broke away from the New Testament. So in the Roman uh, Catholic Church, doctrines continued to evolve. There's new doctrines, new practices, new ordinances that are uninspired by the Holy Spirit. They are not found in the New Testament. One of these doctrines is the doctrine of penance that came along, that you actually needed to be assigned when you repented of your sins, uh, some uh, temporal type of punishment for your sins in order to be forgiven. It also led this doctrine to the sale of indulgences, that you could buy by gifts uh, these writs, this, these papers that would take away your need for penance. 
with these uh, indulgences from the church, you could also have souls set free from punishment after death in purgatory. Purgatory is another uh, doctrine that was introduced that's not found uh, in our New Testaments. So you had great sums of money that were earned through the sale of these indulgences uh, to remove your temporal punishment and your penance over sins. Some of these indulgences could even be for sins you had not yet committed. So you purchase forgiveness in advance. You could release loved ones from their punishment in the afterlife. Uh, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, another soul from purgatory springs was one of the statements that was made as these priests would go about Europe selling these indulgences. Great sums of money were raised from the people by the sale of these things. The St. Peter's Cathedral, that wonderful cathedral, uh, was built by the funds that could be raised in part from the sale of indulgences. So you just see how much of a uh, money-making proposition this was. As you look at new doctrines that were introduced, the separate priesthood is introduced. It's borrowed from the Old Testament. It doesn't come from the New Testament. That you have a separate priesthood. You have a clergy and a laity. There's no such distinction found in our New Testament. When we read the New Testament, all Christians are priests. These uh, new priestly order was able to pronounce forgiveness or retention of sins. You were required to go to confession and the priest now that has been instituted can pronounce forgiveness, can uh, give you certain forms of penance that you need to pay for your sins in order for them to be forgiven. When we read in the New Testament, every Christian's a priest. There's only one person you need to go to in order to seek forgiveness in the New Testament, and that's Jesus Christ. There is one mediator between God and men. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5. Sins are confessed to God. We don't confess the sins uh, to somebody else in order to get forgiveness. We go through Jesus Christ to God the Father to be forgiven. So there have been great changes that have happened over the centuries to the doctrines that were being taught. Jesus kept his promise when he said that the Holy Spirit would come and guide the apostles into all of the truth. He did that. He inspired their teachings and writings, and they gave to us a perfect revelation of Christ's will. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, by the year 100 AD, all of the New Testament had been written. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Jesus gave all of the truth to the apostles. They were guided into everything that pertains to life and godliness. And through those scriptures, the man of God may be adequately equipped for everything that he needs through that word. God's word is what can get us to heaven. When the apostle Paul was uh, taking his leave of the elders from Ephesus in Acts chapter 20. He didn't say that he was leaving them uh, to be in charge of people's salvation. He didn't say the elders of the church are the ones that can get you to heaven. No, he said it's the word of God that is what is going to guard the church. It's the word of God that's able to give you an inheritance in heaven. So we are commended not to uh, a body of men that are going to be able to make laws and rules for the church, but we are commended to the word of God. Acts 20 and verse 32, And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. The word of God is the seed of the kingdom. There have been many uninspired doctrines that were introduced into Roman Catholicism. You had all of the truth that we need to save us and make us adequate in the New Testament, but to that they added on the idea of holy water, uh, especially blessed water that would be able to have different powers. 
to cleanse or to protect and so on. They had the Latin Mass where they turned the Lord's Supper into an actual sacrifice of Christ today. Uh, you had the idea of extreme unction where persons needed to be anointed by a priest before their death in order to be healed in their soul and possibly their body. There was celibacy demanded of all of the priests. That's not found in the New Testament. We know Peter was married as well as the other apostles. And elders in the New Testament church, the bishops or overseers, had to be married men and had to be men that had believing children. As you look at the doctrine of transubstantiation, which was finally uh, made a binding law in, the, in about 1200 A.D., which said that the elements of the Lord's Supper, the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine, are transmuted into the actual body and blood of Christ. That doctrine was not taught in the early church. These things were recognized as symbolic and a memorial to remind us of the Lord Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross. The idea of purgatory is something that is introduced, that there's some period of punishment for uh, Christians after death. That's not taught in the New Testament. Changes in singing and the introduction of instrumental music was a change that happened in the late 600s and was introduced into the Catholic Church. There were sprinkling for baptism and infant baptism introduced. That did not exist in the New Testament. All we read about in the New Testament is the baptism of believers, people that had repented of their sins and confessed Christ. So many different changes. And unfortunately, as we study the rise of the Protestant Reformation and Protestant denominationalism, we're going to see that many of these doctrines were carried over and taught among some of the Protestant churches as well, which is certainly a problem. In 1 Timothy 4 and verses 1 through 3, but the Spirit explicitly says that in latter times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons, by means of the hypocrisy of liars, seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron, men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods, which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. The word of God foretold there would be departures. What is our answer? What is our antidote to these things? Preach the word. Come back to the original pattern in the New Testament. Try to faithfully live according to that word which we know is right and can't be wrong, the word that is found in the New Testament. Well, I hope that this lesson will be a blessing to you. Hope you understand that in all of these things, my only desire is to advocate for the original faith that Jesus taught, the original church that he established according to the pattern found in God's word in the New Testament. I believe that that is the safe and right way for all of us to follow. And I encourage you to think deeply about these things. God bless you and be with you.